a little slowly perhaps while people filter in um, and someone was saying in the chat I think that perhaps a different session was announced but I think this is a great one. Um, my name is Owen Appleton and uh, I work for EGI where I'm the service portfolio manager. Uh, I do as I think uh, Dale said in my introduction to the last session much the same uh, for the EOS Cup project. So I lead the task that's related to service portfolio management uh, and to onboarding. So I think that's why I've been asked to give this talk today. Um, let's, uh, let's do the regular housekeeping we I think have for all of these, these sessions. Uh, the event's being recorded, uh, a link will be available. So all mistakes or coughs or anything else will be uh, recorded in perpetuity. Please don't act, uh, activate your microphone and video unless the host gives you permission. So for this session, there'll be a couple of speakers and then there'll be a couple of others uh, helping out uh, later on in the session with, uh, with answering some of your questions. Uh, and I think for this session, we will use uh, Zoom for, for questions. Um, if you do want to speak, you can raise your hand and one of, the, one of the team will try and indicate that someone wants to speak. Uh, but if you, uh, but you can also, like I said, write your questions in the chat without any problem. Okay, um, let me give you the overview of the session. <clears throat> uh, the session is about uh, onboarding in general and service catalogs. Uh, I'm going to give a kind of general introduction to the current status of onboarding first, um, and this will hopefully tell you where we are today, uh, which is some good, some bad, some complicated, uh, as I think. Uh, most people expect. Uh, but then I want to move on from that to talk about uh, what's coming next. So we will have Jorge Sanchez from JNP and the EOSC Enhance project who will present uh, their uh, soon to be released uh, provider and resource profiles, which you would previously probably see called service description templates, uh, which is something that will be available very soon and will probably be the basis of onboarding into EOSC for at least quite a large number of projects and, and participants. How widely it goes will be up to the participation of you, of you here. Then I will come back and I will talk a little bit about a slightly more aspirational vision for where I think we're going to, going to go or need to go because what we have today is an intermediate solution and I think it definitely has a lot of room for improvement. And I want to make sure that we have some shared vision of where we can go and what benefits we can bring uh, in terms of how we onboard resources into EOSC, how we connect them to EOSC. So I think that's an important thing to do. Um, then we will have a space for, for discussions at the end. Um, one of the things I would quite like to discuss is how we implement the user participation. And for that, we'll have the participation of a couple more of my colleagues. So we'll have Mark van der Sanden from SURF and Matthew Villian from EGI, who are both intimately involved in the onboarding. So that's our outline. Uh, let me go ahead. Uh, this is what I want to talk about. Uh, what's onboarding? How does it work today? And I will mention the catalogue uh, and onboarding interest group at the end. Right, uh, those that know me know that I love a diagram. Uh, <laughs> I have yet another one for you to look at. Uh, again, not a perfect representation, but an attempt to show what onboarding is for those of you that perhaps might not already be very aware of this if you're from the broader community. So in this view of the, the world in which we're working, up top in pride of place is the research community, understandably. Um, below that, there is a layer, which I've called the portals and APIs, how they interact with the rest of EOSC. There is a space for the researcher facing resources, which would be called the exchange in the Tin Man vocabulary, I think. Uh, and then under that, underneath that, there are the EOSC core services, the internal services, the federating core, depending on your terminology, and then below that, the providers who support those core services. So uh, we have some uh, set of different actors in this space. We have obviously users from the research community, hopefully more every week and every month. Uh, we have providers who provide services within this uh, researcher facing resource space, and those providers come with resources. They come with services, they come with data, there will be other kinds of resources as well, research products, papers, software. And this terminology of resources, I think Jorge will mention as well a little bit later, but uh, it's an important uh, way to be able to cover all of the different kinds of entity we expect to see in EOSC. There is sometimes a tendency to focus just on services and compute or just on data. Neither of them are a complete picture. So by resource, we mean any of those things. Then, of course, we have um, 
uh, some core services in the in the core of EOSC. These are the internal services which keep things running, uh, the AI, the accounting, the monitoring, the help desk, and there are some providers who support them. And when a user wants to benefit from EOSC, they will, through some portal or some API, try and access some services, some resources. Uh, they will be connected through these portals or APIs to a service provider and their resources. And uh, this provider will then be supported, hopefully, by the core services of EOSC, uh, for instance, by AI, and this is supported by a core provider underneath. What we mean by onboarding is adding to this pool, so bringing providers into the researcher-facing resource area and bringing their resources with them. Uh, this is what we say is onboarding. So I would define this as connecting providers and their resources to EOSC such that they can be accessed by researchers and can build over core services so they can interact with both sides. Hopefully that is, is clear to everyone. Just click forward. Okay. Now my slides are frozen, so let me just try that one more time. Um, no. Sorry, we're having a typical technical problem. Uh, let me try that again. No. I'm afraid we may be experiencing a slight issue. I will stop sharing my screen and start again. Uh, One second, and then we'll try this again. It was going so well. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, if you can display your Hub 1, uh, that would be useful. I don't know why it's glitching from my side. It seems to be a Zoom issue. There's quite a lot of animation, but I'll tell you where to go. Okay, we'll try it this way. Apologies. Yeah, so stop there. <laughs> I'll tell you where to go forward. So uh, in order to, to move forward a little bit, we have to unfortunately understand where we've come from because the current practice of onboarding is very much related to the different actors uh, who are involved. So uh, both the EOSC Hub and the Infra Central projects have both been onboarding uh, providers and services in the past. Uh, if you can go forward. Uh, these go into their own catalog. Yeah, that's fine. These go into their own catalog, the EOSC Hub Marketplace and the Infra Central catalog. Uh, there was then a request from the EC, uh, which came somewhat unexpectedly, but was a positive move forward to create EOSC portals. So to combine these two different um, uh, listings of services or resources into a single space. And this is what we see with the EOSC portal website and the EOSC portal catalog or marketplace, depending on how, you've, how you see it listed, uh, which is embedded within the EOSC portal. Now, if you go forward. Um, while that has been what we've been doing up to now, there is now a new path for onboarding, which is just coming online. Uh, this is from the EOSC Enhance project, which Jorge Sanchez, our next speaker, will, will, will talk about. So EOSC Enhance brings together a lot of the people who were anyway involved in generating EOSC portal, but is meant to take over a lot of the technical uh, responsibilities around providing the portal, around the tooling and the platforms used for it. It also more explicitly brings the open air community in. Uh, so previously, OpenAir were involved in the development of the portal, but we weren't onboarding uh, data or other research products from OpenAir into the portal. Now this is definitely something which is, uh, which is intended. You can go forward. And then lastly, there is a, 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 another path for how we, uh, how we bring things into the portal, which is from the other uh, groups, whether they are thematic projects, national and regional projects, or any other uh, community uh, portal community group who have their own uh, registry of services, registry of resources, and wish to add them to EOSC. 
uh, and we see it as a, a necessity that there will be a way for them to bring them into EOSC uh, as automatically as possible. So I've used here um, some of the logos from the Infra EOSC 4 and 5B projects, but I think we can see this is representing a, a far larger group. If you go forward. So as I said before, uh, this top blue path, this is what's working now and it works, but it's a little bit messy because it's in the process of integrating a number of different efforts. The path through Enhance is being launched really right now. Um, we're moving to an enhanced based onboarding or an enhanced sponsored onboarding process very soon and data we hope to see showing up later in the year. And then this last path, it's planned. There are some experiments. Um, but uh, it's not yet in, I'm not yet to a, a finished level there. Uh, right now, what we're onboarding is services, because that's the only thing which we have been set up to onboard. But in the long run, we definitely have to be thinking about onboarding all resources. So services is what came first. We're looking how to expand into data and particularly the research products that are coming out of open air. And in the future, it has to really cover all possible resources. But we're not there yet. Uh, right now, it's, it's really based on services, partly trying to answer questions that pop up while we talk. Can you move forward? So this is the uh, current, what I would call it, meta process for providers. Um, in fact, you can go forward another one as well. Um, and this is the, the process that providers have to go through in order to uh, get right now a service, but in principle, any resource into EOSC. First, they have to somehow submit a request. Uh, this can happen in a couple of different ways. Uh, and this is maybe showing that the process is a little messy. Um, for instance, there is a form on EOS portal which you can fill. There is also an email address, join at mailman.eoscup.eu. It's a typo on the slide there. Um, or indeed, we do get onboarding requests through personal emails to people involved in the process. And this is not ideal, but this is the reality of the world we work in. We definitely want to make these processes stronger and push everyone through them rather than have many different ways in. Uh, but this is how it's looking right now. Still, pretty much however you contact at least EOS Cup, you end up in the same place, which is being asked to fill uh, an online or offline form, or hopefully soon uh, um, provide data via an API, which describes your service and describes your provider. Uh, this information gathering phase, we, we internally call shifting, if you ever hear that term, although it's not particularly useful to the outside. From here, we have to go into a validation step. So we have to check the appropriateness of a resource. Uh, but does it comply with the now emerging rules of participation? Is this something which should be part of EOSC, as much as we're empowered to say that, certainly. And then lastly, there's a publication step where the resource appears in public pages, um, which is uh, well, well, we'll see in a sec. If you go forward one more step, um, I've highlighted some of the problems with this process as it stands today. Um, like I said before, the, uh, the entry point, there's multiple entry points and perhaps the documentation could be better. I think a lot of this documentation needs to be moved to EOSC portal. It partly sat on different project websites up to now. Uh, filling a form, they're, they're fairly long right now, although not all of them are, are required. We'll see this later. And if you come to the training for onboarding uh, services tomorrow. We will go through the current EOS Cup form in some detail. Uh, there are also various versions of the different uh, onboarding forms, depending on whether you talk to Infra Central, or you talk to EOS Cup, or when you talk to one of these projects, they do get updated over time. Uh, some are files, some are web forms. Validation actually works pretty well within EOS Cup, but at the same time, it's going to be challenging to scale it effectively to a very high volume of services or other resources, which we expect to see. So we're well aware that this validation step has to be improved. And then lastly, the, the, the publication step, frankly, right now is very, very manual. And this is something that sometimes frustrates providers. Publication takes some time because there's some transcription information, checking back with providers that it's acceptable. Uh, showing them a draft of an entry in EOS portal before things go live. This is certainly somewhere where in the future we expect to see a lot more automation. We'll go forward. Right, um, this in fact we can almost skip over directly to the next slide because they cover in, indeed much the same stuff. Uh, I talked in, in terms of validation about the criteria which are used to decide whether a service should be in EOS. And this is something which I think is important for everyone to understand. Uh, and you don't have to read the fine details of this now, and this is also available on the web on the uh, service provider documentation part of the EOSCUB wiki, which is public. But even if you fill in all of the 
uh, forms that are provided accurately. It may be that you're simply not the kind of resource or service that we see as fitting the ask. We try to take a relatively liberal view, but there do have to be some restrictions. For instance, about once a week, we have an organization trying to sell Louis Vuitton handbags or Pandora bracelets, trying to onboard their webshop to EOSC, which we consider as out of scope of EOSC. Um, and this is a, a real issue. This may, this may go up uh, over time. We will have to deal with this amount of spam, but we have to have some criteria. So if you go to the next slide, I can show you not the criteria we've been using up to now, but the criteria that we are that we are moving to based on some recent discussions. And I don't want you to go through all of this because you can do that at your leisure. I want to highlight the, the part that's involved in the middle. Um, that basically it is very important that services somehow are related to EOSC if we're going to bring them into EOSC. So the way we've tried to convey this, although with some notes, is that a service must be targeted to EOSC in EOSC communities or it must build on or leverage EOS capabilities to serve some other community. Uh, let me give you a brief example of that. Being targeted to EOS or EOS communities, I think of this, and I've given this example many times in other talks, as the Dutch post office question. What would happen if the Dutch post office wanted to onboard a service to EOS? Would we consider that that was actually an appropriate thing to be part of EOS? Dutch researchers, my colleagues at SURF, might choose to use the post office to send uh, information to their colleagues. There's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't seem particularly suited. So what we've tried to say is that it's not so much that a service or another resource has to come from the research community or be for, well, it could be for the research community in general, but it should somehow address the OSC. To give you an example of this, if, uh, if we accept commercial services in the OSC, in the exchange, and Google wanted to come with their Google Cloud Engine, uh, I would probably not accept that because it's a, of a generic service that frankly serves any community. If they were to make a slightly more specific service offer that was the Google um, Cloud Engine for EOSC, I think this would be far more uh, compelling and far more likely to be accepted. Or if they onboarded one of this, uh, the science uh, science specific services they have i think that would be more acceptable but we have to have some sort of dividing line here and i have to tell you that we have questions that, that uh, make this line difficult to understand on probably a weekly basis especially now the other criteria there um, building on or leveraging your capabilities i think probably most of the people really interested in industry are perhaps in the other session that's going on right now about industry and EOSC, but uh, EOSC Hub supports the EOSC Digital Innovation Hub, which is a platform for collaboration with industry where SMEs are invited to come in to build on the expertise, the resources, the infrastructure that is available through EOSC to create new commercial services. These are not targeted at us as researchers, they're targeted at the commercial sector, but they are still an added value coming out of EOSC. So because they're building on or leveraging EOSC, we would consider them as as, uh, as valid for inclusion in EOSC. Can you go to the next slide? So that's really all I wanted to say about onboarding today. I'm a couple of minutes behind, but not anything too much. But I do want to make one last uh, pitch, should we say. After the last time we all met, physically then rather than virtually, in Budapest for the EOSC Symposium, uh, a number of interest groups were formed. So these interest groups were supposed to be uh, places to discuss issues across all of the projects involved in the EOSC landscape, the 30 to 50 then, I guess, projects that were going on. And one of them is the Service and Research Product Catalogues Interest Group, which also definitely covers issues around onboarding. Up to now, these groups, or certainly this group, has not been active at all. Uh, it has some members of which I am one, but I think it's lacked input to get it going. So one thing I want to, to say coming out of this, this event when I think onboarding is increasingly of interest to all of the, uh, certainly the cluster projects and the 5 p projects, is uh, can we start to use this platform to discuss some of these issues? So I think we need to discuss um, the kind of catalogs we have, the profiles which Jorge is going to present in a moment, and I think a consultation on these profiles is something that will be well done there the onboarding process and the criteria that I just presented. And I think we can certainly, after this event, upload the, the slides from this session and the recording of this session, and then hopefully enhance and the EOSC Hub will start to put some material here for wider consultation, because I think this is a really important thing to do. Now the next slide. 
Yeah, so that was the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much. I did see some uh, some questions, which we'll try and uh, re return to at the end, I think, because I'd like to move on to Jorge's talk, because the, some of the questions I think will be answered by that, others we'll try and capture later on. So I will try and scroll back in the chat later. If not, uh, please retype your question and get to the question section afterwards. So now I will mute myself and hand over to Jorge Sanchez, who is from JMP and from the EOSC Enhanced Project, where he leads the activities around profiles, onboarding, and other issues which are very relevant to the discussions we're having today. Jorge, go ahead. Good afternoon to all from uh, sunny Athens. Today we are at 34 degrees, uh, so the summer is already here for us. And I hope uh, really uh, that very soon this it will be possible for all of you to travel and fly to your preferred place for the summer. I'm going to cover uh, the provider and resource profiles version 3.0. Uh, as uh, Owen said, uh, previously known as the service description templates, later on service and resource description templates. Um, one of the major challenges that uh, uh, the European Open Science Cloud aims to address is the historical uh, lack of uh, interoperable online catalogs of research resources that uh, will enable the European researchers to explore uh, those across Europe. Is uh, something very, very similar, even worse, in many other domains, uh, except from the research domains, where uh, even some interoperability at a large extent is possible. Uh, our uh, researchers, as you very well know, uh, most of you are part of uh, this ecosystem, uh, live, work, or conduct research across borders. And this mobility needs to be supported by cross-border services and seamless uh, exchange of data. Uh, unfortunately, in many cases, the environment in which uh, these data exchange take place uh, uh, is uh, very complex, uh, creates many semantic interoperability conflicts that uh, are in many cases uh, uh, caused uh, by lack of uh, commonly agreed uh, data models, the absence of uh, universal reference data, etc., etc. Uh, you very well know that uh, the EOSC is part of a significant European initiative that is the sin single digital market. Therefore, in the same uh, context, uh, the EOSC is trying to break the borders uh, of research data services uh, across uh, Europe. To achieve that goal, we need to harmonize all those resources provided by European providers to increase the, the user uh, base by making those resources discoverable. Uh, we need to widen the pool of users uh, across all scientific uh, communities and domains, including uh, also industry, government, and uh, even citizens. We also need to support the providers in this uh, shared language and path to users to support uh, all the community to become more user-oriented, user-centric and business-focused. Uh, also, it is significant for the overall European economy to identify through those efforts, over overlapping efforts, but uh, also gaps. And last but not least, to uh, via this increased competition to facilitate continuous improvements and uh, speed up uh, innovation. Um, uh, as uh, you very well know, many European research providers have uh, already their own uh, public catalogs. They are uh, uh, making their offers uh, publicly available to any researcher. Uh, many others are at uh, a very early stages of developing their catalogs. Uh, they are following uh, diverse standards, framework and approaches. Uh, some are describing their resources with a varying level of detail and complexity, uh, and uh, others uh, have uh, still no 
discoverable or accessible path to their uh, resource or offerings. Um, to move to in the presentation, I would like to provide here two definitions uh, for the resources and the providers that are actually the two uh, first entities that we are providing those profiles. So the resources are assets made available by means of the EOS system and according to the EOS uh, rule of participation to the ESC, uh, end users to perform a process useful to deliver value in the context of the EOSC. Um, in uh, uh, some years ago, uh, uh, InfraCentral, uh, later on EOSC and Hub and other projects mainly work on services, but EOSC resources include the services, data sources, research products, and any other assets. Currently, we are also working into incorporating instruments and other similar assets, physical assets, also in the EOSC. The providers are the EOS system users responsible for the provision of uh, one or more of those resources to the EOSC. And um, they are uh, either organizations, a part of an organization, uh, or a federation that manages and delivers the resources to the end users. They take various forms, as you know, they can or they are called differently, resource providers or service providers or data providers, service develop, research infrastructures, distributed research, et cetera, et cetera. In this uh, uh, complex and uh, domain, uh, one of the projects that is supporting this uh, unification, homogenization, uh, is uh, EOSC Enhance. The main objectives of the projects is to facilitate the interoperability of uh, EOS providers and resources across all the scientific di disciplines. And uh, the project is mainly focusing on unification of processes, specification guidelines uh, and tools, as well as uh, APIs uh, for the exchange of uh, information among uh, uh, providers. Second, the project is trying to enhance the discoverability of those resources through uh, a number of technical enhancements, uh, mainly focusing, of course, on the EOSC uh, portal. And those uh, enhancements uh, are both uh, for the EOSC providers and the end users. We are going to consult uh, with the EOS ecosystem on all key results to allow for this uh, wide adoption of and underpin interoperability. And uh, last but not least, uh, EOS Enhance is also trying to establish the EOS portal as one of the distribution points uh, or uh, points of access, depending on how you see it as a provider or as a user for the EOSC resources. We fully understand that the EOSC is a system of systems, uh, that uh, we have catalogs of catalogs, so we uh, are trying to allow uh, all the possibility for to develop all those distribution points and open the market. Uh, the, those uh, key results are currently supported by a, a partnership that includes the uh, four uh, flagship infrastructures, CGI, UDAT, Giant, and Open Air, as well as the uh, five cluster projects and uh, a number of uh, partners that uh, have the capacity to develop uh, uh, software as well as uh, specifications and some other supporting functions to achieve the goals uh, that I presented before. Uh, within the uh, EOSC Enhance, we have a specific uh, action that is working on EOS portal specification interoperability and quality framework. In this one, we are developing a framework for defining and describing those EOSC entities and uh, also to exchange the information, the metadata of these uh, entities automatically to allow this uh, scalability and sustainability of operations that are needed. The first one we call EOS provider and resource profile. The second one are the EOS Open REST APIs. This is uh, the big picture that we want to serve. Uh, providers are uh, providing resources. Uh, some of those resources are uh, uh, cataloged in uh, uh, 
registries, in uh, repositories, in marketplaces, uh, in distributed research infrastructures, in regional clouds or thematic clouds. And uh, what uh, we are trying to do uh, for the purpose of uh, allowing all those distribution channels to exist, as well as the EOSC, a single point also to be able to uh, gather all those uh, resources at uh, European level, are the profiles and the APIs. So the way that we describe those entities that we need to exchange, the metadata, as well as the interfaces uh, that are uh, uh, implemented by the uh, entities that exchange that, that information in an automatic way without human intervention. The description templates, uh, the profiles are also uh, equally significant for the onboarding process because uh, this is the way that we can actually uh, have a homogeneous um, and if you want EOS compliant onboarding process, including the validation. The validation that happens based on the information that the provider give to us, as well as the information on the resource. Uh, as we speak, we are working on the main onboarding process. Uh, Owen already presented uh, the, uh, the status of uh, it. Uh, also, the onboarding process is in a, uh, we're working on the uh, unification of that uh, for the next version of the EOS portal. And as you can understand, uh, in the future, other uh, uh, profiles for other entities may be needed to be also defined. For the specifications that we have at hand, for the two profiles that has been a lot of work in the past that started in 2016 by a group of uh, projects that defined the first e-infrastructure catalog of services, a number of uh, uh, commercial um, also companies are working on various uh, areas like the TM Forum is one of uh, those as well as uh, a significant activity, a, a European project fed the same that provided one uh, standard for lightweight service management, fit the same that also provided some groundwork on what we are uh, currently trying to achieve. Those uh, prior uh, efforts uh, consolidated in a number of uh, versions by various activities. Uh, the current version that the InfraCentral has been onboarded is uh, version uh, 1.13, EOS Hub uh, version 1.3, and a new version that has been developed with the incorporation of a, a quite a significant number of uh, background information on the definition of those entities uh, in countries version 2.0. So we leave all this back uh, in the past because we are moving to a new version, version 3.0, uh, that uh, we hope that this will be a de facto standard for the description of providers and resources and the definition of the APIs for the EOSC. As I said before, we, are, we have defined two profiles, uh, the provider and the resource at this point of time. Uh, the specification uh, uh, provides uh, the full uh, data model, the conceptual model, that includes the, uh, for all the attributes of the model, the coding scheme, a definition, the uh, type compliant to uh, uh, API specifications, RDF, et cetera, multiplicity, whether the uh, attribute uh, is compulsory or not, and uh, furthermore, uh, whether the information we collect here is something that will be made available based on the um, EOSC uh, uh, private uh, policy. The uh, model also provides a significant of uh, code list and classifications uh, that uh, are there to facilitate the implementation of uh, onboarding schemes to facilitate the uh, incorporation of the metadata by the providers, but most significantly to support the user journey in any uh, catalog, including the EOSC portal. So some of the 
code list uh, are uh, code list that uh, we have uh, just uh, uh, using from uh, organizations that are maintaining uh, those continuously and some others that have been uh, actually developed uh, through the activities InfraCentral, EOSCAB, Catris and others in the past. Uh, the, the specification also provides um, uh, the, an onboarding guide uh, that is uh, very useful for the providers that want to onboard to have guidelines for each one of the attributes, but also gives uh, also guidance for the uh, human-based and machine-based validation on each one of the attributes of the specification. Um, the uh, specification also provides uh, a transition uh, plan uh, from previous versions of the uh, specification to new ones. And as we speak, uh, those transitions are already happening from uh, InfraCentral and EOS Hub registries to the new uh, model uh, that we have presented. Uh, very uh, fast to tell you that uh, currently the two profiles include uh, some blocks of information. As you can see, we have uh, tried to uh, homogenize also the description of the various uh, entities that we are defining. For the provider, we have the basic marketing classification, location, contact maturity information, and a number of other uh, attributes that are under the other information block. And similarly to the resource profile, we have a number of uh, information blocks, uh, some of which are similar to the provider and some new ones like uh, dependencies, attribution, management, access and order and financial information. The minimum set for interoperability uh, on the two profiles is the following. So if uh, anyone wants to be interoperable uh, with uh, the EOS portal or the EOSC in general, whether this is uh, adopted uh, overall, uh, you need for the profile to provide only the ID, name, abbreviation, website, description, logo, address, and, some, and, and contacts. And similarly for the resource profile, there is a number of uh, minimum set of attributes. Uh, this minimum set means that uh, when you are able to exchange this information, you are able to communicate with other uh, uh, entities in uh, the uh, EOSC, including the EOSC portal, and that you can, of course, provide additional information, whether this is uh, needed, for other purposes. For the purpose of the EOSC portal and for the overall cataloging functionality, and the user journey that we want to offer there, there is a number of additional attributes specified in the profiles. Furthermore, uh, any other entity uh, can include and extend the model with additional blocks of information for their own purposes. Uh, the only thing that is needed is that uh, this minimum set is maintained at least by uh, all of us. The uh, specification provides also a large number of classifications, I mentioned before, some of which are here, uh, from scientific domains, county, etc. All this is coded to facilitate and homogenize all the exchange of uh, information and the APIs. And uh, I finish uh, here by saying a, a, a number of topics that could be of interest to the overall community. Uh, apart from those profiles. Uh, as uh, uh, Owen mentioned before, we have been uh, also working on the specification of the OS portal onboarding process uh, in April. Uh, this process is also finalized. There are still uh, a number of uh, small things that uh, we need to complement. Uh, basically, the tooling behind the onboarding process, some ticketing system behind to support that. Uh, we have also uh, concluded with the specification of the OS portal new requirements, collection, validation, prioritization, implementation, and provision process. The specifications for the OS profile will be delivered this month. Uh, we are expecting a final approval by the Project Management Board of EOSC Enhance. 
uh, and then we will be working in May additionally for the on the placement of the metadata on the provider UX UI in June on the placement of the metadata of the end user UX UI later on we will provide uh, UML RDF and XML uh, for all for the two um, uh, entities also to prepare uh, uh, the all the possibilities for exchange of, of information and the APIs we will extend uh, the ESG resource profile uh, for research products in July. Uh, a number of online training tutorials will be offered for all these onboarding use of the, uh, the specifications, the profiles, etc. in August. And uh, in September, we will extend the ESG resource profile with for, for data sources. In October, the specification of the ESG portal APIs based on version 3.0 will be ready. And uh, this uh, specification means that the, the actual implementation of the API is also in place, fully tested for anyone to onboard through this uh, API. The specification of the, uh, the quality assurance and support measures uh, framework will be ready in November, in November 2020. In the meantime, uh, the EOS portal is uh, currently being uh, updated with uh, all the requirements that have been uh, collected, a full redesign of the user uh, journey, the user component, as well as the provider component is uh, currently being taken uh, place uh, via an agile method where every week additional requirements are implemented. And uh, in December 2020, or a little bit earlier, before the end of uh, EOS Hub, uh, we are planning to update all the above specifications to version 4.0 and in this process we expect to receive and incorporate in the specifications the feedback uh, from the community. That's uh, for, from me now. I want to mention as a last point that all the material produced, uh, 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 specifically the one that I met, pro provided now, but most of it is uh, created under uh, Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 uh, for everyone to make use of uh, it in their similar uh, activities. Thank thanks you, for, and I give back the floor to you, Owen. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Um, comprehensive talk through what's going on in the service and, and provider profiles. And I think, like we said, we will try and do some of the consultation using the interest group, as well as other channels as well because I think this is definitely something we need to, to do more of. Uh, okay, I'm going to try presenting my screen again and we'll see what happens. If it fails, then I will switch back to um, uh, trying to um, do this the old fashioned way with one of the other people presenting their screen, but it's worth a go. Because I have more animations in the next talk as well. So hopefully you can all now see my uh, see my presentation. Uh, I won't be able to chat right now. Let me just back up. You see that. Right. Uh, okay. So now we've heard uh, from Jorge back to me. We've had the sort of current status. We've had the immediate next steps of what's going on with the Ask Enhance. I want to talk about a little bit of a further vision for what it looks like to connect providers and resources to EOSC. Um, and I have a few points I want to touch on in this. I want to talk about the end goal, uh, which I see as a, a system of systems. So hopefully this is something which is shared by other people. Um, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to look at what that means in terms of a user view and in terms of a provider view. And then I want to have a couple of examples of uh, adding value on top of these basics uh, of the OSC. And then hopefully we'll have time at the end for some discussion as well. So, a system of systems. I think one thing I want to say straight away, and hopefully this is I think also something Jorge kind of intimated, I don't see an appetite for a single monolithic EOSC, and I really don't see anyone that does. I see a lot of people who are enthusiastic about EOSC, who want to build it, uh, but at the same time, they want to, to make sure that they're not having their own community pushed out in favor of a central path into EOSC that everyone must take. I don't think this is going to happen. Uh, I think there is definitely enthusiasm for 
bridging, as I've said on the slide, you know, national, thematic, and community boundaries. We want to extend research, we want to extend science, but not at the cost of the communities that brought us to you. And a system of systems approach is definitely uh, one of the most realistic ways of doing this. It's a, an approach, I think, from systems engineering, where you deal with uh, a collection of cooperating groups. They are uh, tied together, they have some harmonization, but they maintain independence in terms of operation, in terms of management. Uh, and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. You should see emergent properties of these systems, where by putting everything together, you'll see new innovations, new opportunities that, that arise, which you wouldn't have seen if they were all separate. Uh, yet we still avoid this monolithic approach. So we take a European federated approach. Hopefully the UK is still involved. Uh, so how does this look from the user side? Um, more diagrams, I'm afraid. So we have a user. Uh, they are a researcher, presumably, and they are happily existing in a world where EOSC is stressing user choice and empowerment. And I think this is definitely where we want to be. They're going to have a number of different ways for me that they can get into EOSC, that they can access EOSC resources. Uh, I would say that they can uh, stick with perhaps a, a community um, a way of getting into EOSC. So if they're part of a particular community, I've suggested PANOSC here on the right. So perhaps we have a photon or neutron scientist. They've been working in that field for 20, 25 years. They have relationships. There are community organizations. They can still access uh, EOSC through, say, a PANOSC portal. Uh, they can also, if they so choose, um, access EOSC uh, via a, a different kind of portal, still not the central one, but something which is regional or national or some other grouping. Clearly, we're going to have these sort of portals coming out of the 5B projects. So I expect to see some from perhaps EOSC pillar here or they have the opportunity to go to EOSC portal being the sort of central access point. Uh, I don't see that these are all gonna be the same, uh, but I see that at least we should strive that the basic benefits of EOSC are available to researchers, whichever access route they choose. Uh, and that means for me, wherever they come in, uh, we're gonna have the same AI, so the same credential system, I hope, we can have the same approach to access policies. Policies will be different in different areas, but we will try and harmonize them so they describe the same. We'll have somewhat integrated help desks. Monitoring and accounting will span across these, uh, these different routes into EOSC so that it might not be uh, that you're grouping data on monitoring and accounting for a provider, but maybe for a user to see what you've used where to be able to show this in your research. Uh, I would also hope that public good, open data sets, things from the open access world, these should be available everywhere within the system, no matter your endpoint. But at the same time, I think there have to be different advantages and disadvantages to the different ways you might come into EOSC. Uh, and I've suggested some you know, possible ones here. So if we look at uh, the sort of regional, national way in, we might have access to local language services, which are really not relevant outside of that. And I know this is particularly relevant for, for instance, the social sciences and digital humanities, where a lot of content is in local languages by necessity, and we lose a lot if we force everything into English. Uh, there might also be nationally subsidized resources. I know these access policies exist today. If we go via a community portal, a community marketplace, you're gonna have a lot of subject-specific expertise. And talking to, um, for instance, recently EOSC Life, I was having a conversation with them, they were saying that they have a level of annotation, the ontologies and vocabularies for their data, which is never going to be replicated realistically in other portals because it's so specific to their communities. That's fine, it can be a unique differentiator of that kind of way into EOSC. And then through the central way in through EOSC portal, here we would hope to have obviously a very comprehensive registry of all the resources available, but also through the, the next round of projects, we're really hoping to see experiments in composability so the ability to take, say, this data set, this visualization uh, um, algorithm, this processing system, and this archiving system, and plug these together all, you know, as seamlessly as possible. Now, I think we know that's not available today, but that's certainly the direction we want to be pointing in. And I think EOS portal needs to support that in its user space. I would also see EOS portal as a place where we'd see some innovative value add services, which make most sense in the central largest portal rather than one of the thematic or regional ones. Uh, obviously, from this is a great story, 
from the user perspective, but it's going to require some sort of coordination. So I think apart from uh, looking at this from the user side, we also have to take a slightly more technical look of what this might mean from the provider side. So this is a different rendering of the same thing. I'll give you a moment to, to digest this. At the top, we have the research community, and then we have a layer of portals and APIs, which is likely how the research community is going to interact with the, 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 the services, the resources that come out of EOSC. On the right side, you see, should we say, the central way into EOSC. So this is at the top, the EOSC portal. There's some website content, and there's also the marketplace of, of services and other resources. This is supported by what I've chosen to call here, and this is a term I've seen from a few people now, the EOSC platform. So here I'm trying to differentiate between what is fundamentally the website part of EOSC and the platform of uh, internal core services and the resource registries that go with it, which not only power the website part and the marketplace, but also allow, uh, uh, allow for connection to services from other actors within the space for value-added services, for connection to regional informatic portals. So I think this EOS platform maybe lessens the fear I have sometimes that when we talk about EOS, we think of EOS as the portal. And if we're just making a website, I think we fail to really have the ambition we need and show the added value we're trying to bring. So this EOS platform includes the central resource registry. So this is the profiles that uh, Jorge was just talking about. It in will include EOS AI, accounting, help desk, other or services other resources and there are obviously providers behind this who are mandated probably by the EOSC legal entity to provide these services. If we look at say a community organization like a thematic or national portal we'll see the same sort of structure. So we'll see a marketplace and a portal there's a web part of it they'll have their own catalog of resources they'll have their own community internal services and providers and there are connections between the two. We definitely need to see connections between the catalogs or registries of resources that are on the EOSC portal and on a community organization. And this is really what Jorge was talking about. But we also, below that, want to see connection in terms of the internal services. So we, we will never, I think, tell a community they must use EOSC AI, uh, but they have the option to, or they have the option to connect their existing solutions to EOSC AI, such that credentials can be shared across a wider space. So let's, uh, let's work this as a slightly more realistic example. Um, and here I've decided to mention randomly EOS Nordic and Escape um, as, as two examples, one of a community and one of a national uh, uh, portal. Um, they really have the same structure as this central structure, which I've simplified a little bit. In terms of, of onboarding, what I would hope is that if a provider onboards to EOS portal through the central EOS channel, they will have their, their resources entered in this central resource registry. And therefore, these will be exposed through EOS portal to the, to the research community. But because of these lateral connections, they will also automatically be propagated to EOS Nordic, perhaps, into Escape, and will appear in, in, in their portals as well. I think there's no reason for that not to happen, as long as we make sure we have agreement from providers that this is the case we want to, want to look at. And then conversely, if you're on board just to EOS Nordic, perhaps, uh, I would expect that to propagate back to the central registry and then across uh, back to escape as well. So I really want to see, or at least I'm hoping to move towards a structure where there is a free flow of the data about resources, services, data, other research products between the different registries in this systems of systems. That we have a central resource registry in, that sits behind the EOSC portal in this platform, which empowers the EOSC portal and is a service provided to the others, should we say a bus for information about resources, um, and that offers some opportunities for some added value services as well, but that its purpose is not simply to create the EOSC portal website. And I think this is a more inclusive view of what onboarding means and benefits it's going to be. So in this system of systems view, um, the idea is on board once, appear everywhere. Hopefully that, that is something which is shared. Uh, that means that the basic provider and resource profiles need to be essentially used everywhere. And this means that we have to have a good basis of for them and get people to agree on them afterwards. Uh, I think we will all agree that there will be a, should we say, a core set of profiles that can be extended by specific communities. There's no problem if the uh, astrophysicists want to add extra data about their resources 
as an extra data block to the profile, it doesn't affect others. I think this is a perfectly reasonable solution, but the core parts remain the same. And we need to make sure that there is a free flow of these, uh, these entries between the different portals, catalogs, and registries. Uh, we also need to make sure, and I think there are other sessions about this uh, today as well, that these internal services are connected to one, one another across the community, that we have really good EOSC level internal services and that they are made available to other communities and to providers. So your credentials work everywhere, your support is somehow, if not integrated, at least interconnected, and uh, you can collate data across the whole community, both for users and also for funders who want to see the impact of their funding. And lastly, there's the opportunity to add value to this picture. So I'm just going to take two examples. Uh, one is uh, from the open air and the other you'll see in a moment. So um, in looking at this sort of picture of, of EOSC, uh, one thing that sometimes I'm not sure where to place are the added value services, which are not addressing a specific research domain, but neither can you say they are absolutely necessary for EOSC to be running at all. So I think if we don't have some AI system, there is no EOSC. I don't know if that's true of, for instance, the open air research graph. On the other hand, the open air research graph, as I'll, I'll mention in a moment, is something that can be extremely valuable and add a lot to EOSC. So we have this sort of middle space between very basic keep the lights on internal services and the researcher focused for a specific community or a specific use uh, for, uh, services in the exchange that we somehow need to find a space for. Uh, and this would be an example. So as I understand it, the open air research graph, and I think I stole some text from some slides from my colleague Paolo Mangi on this, um, it, it basically interlinked data about scientific products from the open access domain, such that you can use it in a whole load of different ways. You can mine this data for business purposes, for research purposes, to understand the impact of your work, <clears throat> There's a, there are a lot of opportunities that come from connecting data about a research product with its publications, software, uh, the communities with it, the organizations, the projects, etc. Uh, and I think this is something which certainly uh, by adding it somewhere into this picture can make EOS greater. And I think that <clears throat> extending the graph, as I say here, to the wider EOS community would really increase its impact. And in a system of systems, there can be spaces for this. Um, it would work in a monolithic uh, kind of model, but there's no appetite for it. But in a fully distributed model, there is sometimes a risk that we don't do these common public good added value services. And I think this is one of the ones that we should, you know, one of the reasons we should look in a space for this. And the other example is more really on the tool side. So this is, uh, this is uh, thinking about if you have this basic structure, what additional tools might you want or need? which are useful to the communities, which do something which isn't otherwise clearly provided. Uh, and one such example is Agora, <coughs> which is a service portfolio management tool uh, developed, I think, originally by GRNet in Greece, but now in use by a whole bunch of different people. The idea here is that one email on board to a specific registry or even to multiple registries. At the same time, um, you may not want to always be providing all your data straight away into that registry. As an organization that may have multiple services, you may want to manage that data internally first. While you prepare it, make sure it's harmonized, make sure that it's really ready to be put out to the wider community. And certainly this is a, a case that, that we see from the EGI, my own organization, and I know it's also uh, something that shows up <coughs> in, um, in other organizations like EU data who are indeed using Agora. So the idea here is to have a platform where you can essentially fill in these, these profiles that we've discussed before, uh, in a, in a, in a uh, coherent way, you can't just you can not only just fill them in, but you can also connect them. So if you have a larger umbrella organization, such as my own, which includes multiple organizations, you can have all of those providers included and connected together through relationships. You can create all your different resources and relationships between them as well. And then when you want to publish them into out into EOSC, you select a target and hit hit publish. It's done. Um, this is still certainly in progress, but the idea here would be not only can I publish, I can also update my services and manage my, the descriptions of my services much more easily than if I'm doing it separately on a whole bunch of different people's pages. So this is a, an, another kind of space for an added value service, which I think you will see in the systems of systems view. Right, that's the end of my, uh, my aspirational part of this talk, and we're um, not far off time, in fact. Um, so I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'd like to move to uh, a, a 
question and answer session. We have quite a lot of time because I didn't want to make this session too long. So I'm very happy to take a, quite a number of questions. I'm going to put a few up, uh, if that's okay. Uh, and I'm going to invite Jorge to, to uh, join me in helping answer them. And also my colleague, Mark van der Sanden from SURF. I don't know if Matthew Villiern is here. I was also, I'd also invited him, but I don't know if he's been able to connect. Uh, and perhaps we can answer some of the questions that have come up in the chat. And so let me, uh, let me put up this slide. I'm going to pop out of presenter mode just so that I can see what's happening for a moment. That's okay. Hopefully while I've been talking, you're all still there. So, uh, Jorge, are you still there? Yes, yes. Great, and Mark, you're there as well? Uh, yes. Fantastic. So, uh, I have a number of questions that I've put up for discussion, but I can see that there are quite a number that have popped up during the, the discussion. Um, I thought I'd maybe select one to start with, uh, because I wasn't able to, to scroll through the chat while I, while, we were, while I was talking, and maybe we can go from there. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Dian asked whether services should expire after a period of time. Um, to make sure that they're still fresh and live, and I saw some discussion of this in the uh, in the chat. But maybe uh, maybe Mark, do you want to give your give your view by voice and publicly, and then we can discuss it a little bit before we move on? Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, also provide a little bit of answer in, in the chat. Um, the 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 server descriptions, uh, the the resource profiles should uh, should be maintained. So we need to process that those. Uh, uh, Descriptions are being maintained on a regular pro, uh, on a regular basis, and that should be part of the responsibilities also of the service providers for uh, for doing. And if this can be stimulated uh, more uh, actively, so that resource providers are doing this, then we can automate this as possible uh, as far as possible. But uh, it is certainly part of the responsibility that services are being maintained, service descriptions are maintained. Uh, and if services are out of business, then those services are being deprecated also within the service catalog. Yeah, I agree. I also think that um, yeah, we have to we have to have a clearer agreement with providers. This is one of those things that's been pending for a while, but it's been hard to do until we get to a certain level of maturity. That um, we have to be much clearer about what reciprocal. I mean, for what we're offering providers, what do we require from them? And part of that will be periodic updating of their data. So yeah. it may not be an expiry so much as you must log in and update your data every six months, every one year, uh, to make sure that uh, you're still connected, you're paying attention. This is a, That's this maybe is also a, a basic level of monitoring can be in place so that you can monitor if the services are available. Uh, we, sh we should see how we can automate this process as much as possible. Yeah, and this is actually an interesting question of monitoring because <clears throat> Uh, one of the balances we have to achieve in integrating uh, these sort of core EOSC um, processes like monitoring and counting AI is how we are, what are we requiring of the providers? How easy is it to, for us to monitor whether a service is alive or not? We can check whether the web page is up, but does that tell us anything about the service? And how much work is it for them to integrate some sort of heartbeat into their service, which can be read by EOSC in a central, in a central way? On the other hand, I think there's something that could be really valuable to, to do as well. Oh, and if I may just pick up on that uh, as Hi, well. Matthew. Hello Good there. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I think it's really important that uh, we retain the quality of the list of services. If we uh, populate uh, any catalogue and have no uh, ongoing verification that the information uh, is live um, and also that the service is still live, then that will very quickly degrade uh, the whole point of having such a catalogue. There should be a way of uh, um, checking that services are alive and there should be a way that service providers can easily update the information that we have about them. Yep, I agree. Okay, um, so uh, we have some questions in the chat <laughs> as well as uh, the questions that I put up, but let's try some of the ones from the chat. Uh, I'm, I see a lot of questions from Dushan, which I will try and answer at some point, but they're pointing at slide numbers, so some of that might be slightly harder for me to pull up. Uh, so let me see, uh, what do we have from Anna here? From a very practical standpoint, how is it possible to make it an obligation for service providers to keep their service descriptions up to date? So this is uh, really building on what we just said. Does anyone want to, want to try and answer that? 
I think you already answered it a little bit in the previous uh, comment. Uh, we need better agreements between uh, as service providers uh, uh, for registering uh, services, uh, but also for maintaining uh, information within uh, the service catalog. Yeah, I think this also comes down to what is our um, what is our uh, recourse if people don't do things, and this is something that's been discussed in the rules of participation as well. In the end, all we can do, and the only real uh, final outcome we have is disconnection from the OSC somehow. And I guess it really depends how important that is for providers, how seriously they take it. It's not something I think any of us want to do, but we are gonna have to have some sort of way to deal with that. I suspect that, um, should we say, suspension might be, uh, might be the, the first thing that you do if someone isn't updating their service after a significant period of time. So maybe it still exists in a, in a registry, but is listed as inactive, uh, or maybe it's delisted entirely, but the data is still there, or maybe you literally just remove them totally from the system. There is gonna have to be some way to deal with that in terms of escalation or appeal as well, which I think will relate to the rules of participation to the legal entity. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm going to try and see if I can tackle some of Dushan's very large number of questions, especially since some of the other ones, other people were, were also asking about them. Uh, so give me a moment to process this. Uh, according to the figure at slide seven, all resources will be registered within the same catalog, both services and repositories. Is this correct? Um, I'll, I'll try and answer that. Basically, in the end, we see that EOSC should include registries of all kinds of resource. Uh, on, on the other hand, we have this very strange situation where much as a lot of the language in EOSC really focuses on data, all of the registries focused on services. And we have to somehow bring these two things together in a, in a, in a more realistic way. Uh, I think that uh, it may not, well, it may be a single registry with two distinct areas, or it may be two registries that sit next to each other on the same page. How the technical solution happens is really a decision that's open. But I do think that some amount, you know, as many of the resources as possible for me should be exposed through the, um, through the OSC portal and through also the other portals from the other communities as well. That's my view at least. Uh, does anyone else want to comment on that? We're all happy with my answer? Uh, yes. I'm happy with, uh, with, the, uh, with the answer. Good. Um, there's also some questions about um, uh, are there, is there one procedure or several um, this, <laughs> for, for onboarding? I think this is something which I was trying to, trying to talk about, but then we hit some technical bumps. There, are, there have been a number of procedures that lead to the same place for at least about four or five months now. So there is a single list of services certainly on EOS portal, which get there some from EINFRA central entries, some from entries that are onboarded via EOS CUB. Um, we are trying to move towards a, 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 a combined process for onboarding for both of those groups. The question then goes to uh, what about the InfraEOSC 5B projects? Should they have to use this process? And I think this is a really interesting question. For me at least, um, we can't tell other projects how to do their onboarding. But I think we're going to have to agree that if we want to shift data about resources between registries, it has to be in a common or mappable format. And if we want to do that without revalidating services and other resources every time they move between catalogs, we have to have a common approach to validation. So certainly what I've been pushing in uh, EOS Club, and we've been discussing in Enhance, and also in some of the preparation with some people for the Infra EOSCO 3 projects is, there needs to essentially be a, a common approach to validating services and that any, for everyone who wants to share uh, resource profiles needs to agree with each other, they will validate things the same way so that we don't have to have these constant barriers. Does anyone else want to comment on that? No, I fully, I fully agree. This, this is uh, our uh, recommendation. Uh, nonetheless, uh, issues like those are things that are currently being discussed in the um, working groups. And certainly this is a topic also for the EOSC legal entity to conclude on the rules of participation, the code of conduct, uh, privacy policy, and this type of uh, 
things that are crucial to allow for uh, distributed onboarding and the uh, system of system as is envisioned by many in this community. Yeah, um, I think also there is a related question here, which um, I have on the on the slide that's popped up. Um, basically, I said, uh, where is it? Should we validate before publication or audit after publication? <laughs> uh, this is something we've discussed a little bit in enhance. Um, right now, how onboarding has worked for EOSCOV uh, is that every service was checked before it went live. Um, and had to be explicitly allowed. I think in the InfraCentral, this was slightly different, that essentially the first service was validated. Is that correct, Jorge? Then after you could... Yes, the, the provider was validated, then the first service was validated, and then after that, we consider the, that uh, the provider has uh, enough maturity to go on and uh, onboard all the remaining services. Nonetheless, uh, a validation is required uh, at uh, some point of time, and therefore, uh, through this, uh, uh, we could uh, allow the scalability needed, especially in heavy uh, times with a lot of onboarding, but keep the quality with the validation that still is uh, possible at a later stage. So what I'm suggesting for the next stage of this, personally, is that we validate providers um, to check that providers are uh, are basically the, the right sort of group so that we avoid the people who, for instance, are trying to sell Louis Vuitton handbags because they do exist. Uh, and then probably with resources, we ask people to essentially self-certify that, that the resources they are then onboarding are compliant. And if they're not, we have an ability to suspend them. There is a, an interesting... Um, reason for perhaps taking this approach, which certainly I think would be easier because it reduces the load and makes things more scalable. Um, if you explicitly approve something, you are in some way taking responsibility for the content. And I think in the days when InfraCentral was starting, they were essentially polling EU projects. This is where they, as I understand, started off. So that they understood that the base of people they were asking about their services were all part of the same world that we're in. This has changed a little bit already now with the EOSC Hub, and now I think with the EOSC is a bigger thing mentioned by senior members of the European Commission. Um, you will have people trying to join who aren't really appropriate. Um, so there is a risk that we validate a service that then turns out to, for instance, be doing Bitcoin mining, and we didn't realize that. And that if we've explicitly said yes to it, perhaps we have some legal responsibility. So apart from a scalability argument, I think there's a liability argument that perhaps onboarding providers, then allowing services to basically be self-certified as compliant, but suspending them if we feel they are not compliant, is probably a more scalable and more realistic approach. Um, this is certainly what I think. I see there is a lot of chat in the chat, so maybe we can try and go back to that. But does anyone else want to, any of the other, the Mark or Matthew, want to comment on yeah. this validation issue? Yeah, the, the, the validation uh, is, uh, is, is a certain challenge on, on, on this. There's also a separation of, uh, of, of responsibility. Um, we can do uh, as much as possible, uh, but we cannot do everything. There was also uh, a comment in the, in the chat of uh, the quality of the service. Uh, and therefore, you need very specialized expertise to, to, to uh, uh, assess the quality of the, of the service. And I think that is also challenging, uh, but also a separation of, of, uh, of responsibilities uh, that uh, service providers uh, provide information truthfully as far as possible and ensure that uh, the quality which they uh, uh, mention as the quality of the service is, uh, is met. Uh, we use the, the technology readiness level for, for showing quality of service, mm. but that is a uh, very difficult to assess uh, and validate, uh, and many people have different opinions on this. So, um, can be challenging on this level. Anyone else want to comment on that? Should we try another question? So, skipping about slightly, uh, I see a question from Tim Pinchetti. What are the responsibilities of resource consumers to ensure good quality and continuity of service? E.g. contracts, monitoring, data processor agreements. 
Uh, I assume that uh, what we're talking about here is the users, their responsibilities, as well as the providers of services. Um, this, for me, is probably covered somewhere by rules of participation, uh, but again, probably needs to be clarified. I think rules of participation definitely need to uh, uh, be directed not only at providers, but also at users of EOSC. They have their own responsibilities. There are terms of service, there are things they mustn't do with the OSC, uh, but I don't know if that's exactly what the question was asking. Um, that's why I was glossing over that one briefly. Um, however, here's another one which we can definitely try and answer. Fotis Karianis uh, is surprisingly, if you've been in other sessions this week, asking about dashboards for end users, which is a topic he's raised elsewhere as well. So uh, he says, are you considering a customizable, personalized dashboard view that can be individualized for each user? Um, the, the current list of services when everything will be ready will be very long and users may not want to spend time in searching around. Also some tagging for individual for specific disciplines, sub-disciplines based on some standards. Kind of glossing over this a little bit. So the question here is, do we foresee a, a user space which is somehow customizable to them? Um, this is, I think, uh, certainly something which Enhance has some views on, right, Jorge? Yes, uh, certainly. Um, uh, there is uh, already a requirement on that uh, for some time, and um, the development team is currently uh, already developed the uh, the space for the users to um, declare to state some of their um, profile, uh, which will uh, hugely help uh, to build uh, functionality to support uh, a, a prediction as what is uh, stating here, uh, based on, on that and previous use or use of similar profiles. Uh, so this is uh, certainly something that will be very soon uh, available on the uh, on the portal. Yes. There's also a comment from Matthew I see here, uh, the answering photos, which I think is is correct. That uh, enhance is meant to do quite a lot of the more basic functionality, the things we really need, and then we're hoping that InfraEOS three will add some additional features as well, some of the extra added value things on top of what enhance is built. Uh, the, whatever InfraEOSC 3 project is funded will overlap with Enhance by pretty much a year, I think, so there will be a good amount of time to do some sort of, some sort of handover. So I see another question. How many services have been onboarded up to now to EOSC, and how many of them have been suspended, as you mentioned in one of the answers? And I see Mark then li linked the uh, EOSC Marketplace. Um, so the EOSC Marketplace, I think, has somewhere in the region of 200 and well high 200s at the moment 261 results um, just to mention that these 261 results because they merged two different lists probably more onboarding has gone on than 261 events because quite a lot were in both lists um, and have been merged uh, that's roughly where we are now and it does go in fits and starts i can tell you there are some weeks where you have a very very great number of requests and somewhere it's rather rather fewer especially when there are funding deadlines or Christmas. Um, the question of how many have been suspended, um, this is, in the world. I see two questions related, how have been suspended and how many have been, or have we rejected any service providers? <coughs> I'll come to the rejection in, in a second, because I think perhaps Mark and Matthew can also talk about that. But mm -hmm. in terms of suspension, honestly, one of the weaknesses of the process today is that we call it onboarding. And what it should actually be called is portfolio management or registry management. And onboarding is, is only one activity within that, which is populating a registry or a portfolio. And the process is for updating and then uh, decommissioning or, or shutting down and checking the, the live, liveliness of resources are not as well developed as the processes for populating the registry. That is an artifact of basically the fact that the OSC portal was an unplanned activity for the projects that put it together, and a huge amount of effort had to go into getting, getting uh, resources in and finding a way to bring resources into it. Now really is a time when we definitely have to improve those other steps. So we need to look at uh, our services still alive, have they been updated recently, and then have a, a more structured process for kicking them out. But in terms of rejection, um, Maybe since Mark and Matthew were both involved in the onboarding team and validation, 
you might want to talk about the kind of rejections we do. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have uh, uh, some rejections, uh, some onboarding uh, um, requests uh, are automatically almost uh, rejected because these come from a commercial uh, web shops uh, try to onboard uh, selling everything what they want. Uh, but also we have some some uh, uh, rejections on basis of, of, of longer discussions because then uh, those are on, on the, in the gray area. How far does this fit within the criteria of, uh, of, of what we have selected for the onboarding uh, uh, criteria? And then you go, for example, to organizations who want to onboard the whole organization uh, and not a spe uh, specific service uh, which they offer. That can be in uh, a human uh, uh, service or a technical IT service. Uh, but also uh, uh, services which are very, uh, very generic, which they offer to, to everyone. So it is not really uh, as specific to what is the added value of providing the service to, uh, to research organizations or to EOSC. So we engage with those service providers to optimize uh, what kind of service they, they really would like to onboard or to shape what would be the, the, the offer for, for EOSC instead of a very generic offer. Um, so we have uh, regular engagements on this, but also internally we have different discussions to see how does this fit within the criteria, should we reject, should we ask more information, uh, or should we adapt? So we have different approaches. Yeah, uh, Matthew, did you want to say something? Uh, just another class of rejection that I can think of is uh, when we determine that a service that is requesting to be onboarded is clearly not of uh, adequate maturity. So yeah. uh, we, we use the TRL, the technology readiness level, uh, to assess the maturity of a service. And if it's uh, uh, nowhere near TRL 8, um, then we would explain uh, the reasons why they would not be uh, mature enough to onboard now and that may be you know um, do some more work and then come back in the future and try again. I think this is yeah. actually a really good, sorry after you Mark. Yeah I think certainly on the TRL level we have some some frequent discussions also on this uh, because uh, the TRL is not really uh, uh, the old way of specifying maturity. We have seen some uh, discrepancies between how the TRL is being listed for the onboarding service or how the service is being promoted uh, towards researchers uh, within their own uh, catalog environments within uh, via their own website and so that is also more an area of, of uh, negotiation discussing with the service provider to, to uh, reflect that the, uh, the, the information which is onboarded within the service catalog uh, reflects as much as possible also how the service is being promoted towards uh, the researcher. Yeah, there's um, something else I want to mention here, which is there is something between acceptance and rejection, which is uh, providers who essentially have to come up with new information that they didn't previously have available in order to meet our requirements. If you look at the requirements for onboarding, really there are two sets. One is you have to fill the form and you have to fill all the required fields in the form. And as uh, I mean, Jorge, Mark and I have had many long discussions about what should be required and what shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, some of the things that are required, so EOS Cup, for instance, requires a privacy policy if you want to onboard a service. We feel that in the era of GDPR, of uh, information security being a big issue, uh, we, don't, we don't validate the quality of your privacy policy, but we expect a mature provider to give some view on the privacy of the information that they are gathering and to make that public. And so we use that as a filtering step to try and uh, see if they're mature enough. A lot of providers don't have this, or they have it for their institution, but not for the actual service. And quite often you find that terms of use, privacy policies, um, even help desks, and by help desk, I don't mean like a ticketing system, I mean even just a generic email to request help for a service are being created because we're asking for them. So we're not only asking people to describe their services, we are kind of slowly drawing up the maturity of the services from the research community through what we ask them for. And I think this is something which has proved actually really quite successful. So 
Um, I see that uh, the, the flow of, uh, of uh, questions has slightly dried up. Um, I see more comments from photos that some of our views need to get up to the executive board. I'm always happy if that happens. Uh, were there any other questions that are recently? Uh, from Hassani Mohammed, which resources are allowed for IA research and what is chemistry of? I'm afraid I don't quite get the, the, the subject of your question, uh, Hassani. Um, I mean, uh, we did show some criteria early, earlier. Really, anything targeted towards EOSC and the research community would, in principle, be allowed. Um, though there are some discussions about uh, whether commercial services should be in or not. This is something that came up yesterday as well, this whole concept of free of the point of use. And I do, would like to use this opportunity to bring in uh, this issue here. Uh, implementing the rules of participation. There were questions about um, uh, you know, what, what precise criteria need to be met to on board. The rules of participation one would expect would provide these, but in fact, the Oz Carbon Infra Central were having to come up with criteria for what to on board before the working groups were created in the first place. Uh, and they are providing some very interesting work, but we have had to, in the meantime, go forward as best we can based on what we think is uh, what our goals and our missions and what our projects are meant to do, and align that with the rules of participation as they, and, and the other things coming out of the working groups as they emerge. And that's sometimes challenging because the rules of participation can be at a much higher level than the practical considerations of do you have a principle? So I see a question from Brenna Silva. Uh, does EOS Cup have funding that goes beyond 2021? Uh, what development or wildlife activities are expected in the near future? Uh, briefly, EOS Cup only has funding for 2020. However, uh, there is a call which ends in June called Infra EOS 03, which appears to include many of the functions that one would see in EOS Cup. And this is for a very, very large scale project starting presumably 1st of January next year. So there is funding for the continuation of this effort. Precisely which services are in, how it's run, who is involved is still to be seen. Uh, but there is funding right now from the Commission for, uh, I think, through 2021, 2022 and into 2023 for this. Uh, there are also some but, calls in Rios but, 7, right? But there is also uh, Iskan Hans. Uh, which also supports uh, for the development of uh, yep. this. Which is till the end of 2021, pretty much. Yeah. So we only have a couple of minutes left according to our schedule. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions or are there any questions which people asked earlier and I missed when there was a very fast pace of questions that they would like to re retype or re-add? No? Okay, uh, and is there anything else, uh, any of my panelists, colleagues, uh, Matthew, uh, Mark or, or Jorge would like to say before we, we end the, this session? Just a shameless plug for the service provider forum uh, tomorrow at midday. Good call, cool. yes. This is actually something I, I should have mentioned, Matthew. Matthew's running a very interesting session for service providers tomorrow based on, uh, I think, surveying some experiences of, of onboarding and of using EOSC. Um, and I think that there's some interesting discussions to be had there, so I encourage you to, to go to that session. Uh, there is a question, can you save the chat? Uh, if there's anyone here from, um, yeah, we saved the chat, there you go. That's pretty much what I knew someone from Trust IT was going to say, because I know they've been on this all week. Um, so that's, that would be helpful. And we'll look at the, the other questions there and try and get some answers to them later. Okay, in that case, I think I think we should stop. I will just say, apart from the plug for the service provider forum, there is also a session which is a training for service providers on, on how to onboard, which is really going to be going through in much more detail the current EOSC hub uh, process for onboarding, looking at really all of the forms that you have to fill in. Um, I do have to say that this is material which is useful, but will soon change somewhat using the profiles which Jorge was presenting earlier, but this gives you an idea of the kind of information that we will be asking whatever the name of the particular file you're filling in is. So I believe that's tomorrow afternoon and that's a rather longer session which I'll be running. Um, <clears throat> other than that, I'd like to thank you all for participating. I think we have really quite a good number of people here and for the very lively questions in the chat. I know this is a question which also uh, a topic which always drives a lot of discussion and I appreciate your participation. 
Okay, thank you all very, very much. And hopefully next time I'll see you all in person rather than virtually. Okay, thank goodbye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Find all the links for tomorrow in the main agenda that has been updated on the ESCAP website. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye.